Europe is in crisis. To begin with some definitions, some facts, and one or two opinions, Europe stretches for our purpose today from the Atlantic Ocean, the coastline of Ireland, Portugal, and Spain in the west, to the Russian border in the east. It comprises 28 nations. For most of the 19th century, Russia would have been included as part of these. But ever since 1917, when Lenin took the train ride from his hiding place in Germany back to Moscow, this has been a stubborn outsider, a hollow country beset by a hollow set of values whose only interest has been to meddle, interfere, and reduce the happiness and success of its multicultured and culturally rich neighbours. Russia will play a part throughout this story as a disgraceful pariah. Its shadow hangs over Europe still, and the further east and south you look, the more significant is its negative gloom. Two other nations or geographical regions that are not part of the European Union will also play a major role in this analysis. The first is the nation of Turkey. This increasingly Muslim republic of some 80 million, that's 20 million more than the population of the UK, is the strategic link between South Eastern Europe and North Africa. Turkey is effectively the bridgehead to the northern coastline of Africa. But let's start by looking at the European Union. Let's size it up and compare it as best I can with our country here, with the United States. Our 50 states here are physically the larger, 3.8 million square miles as against the nearly 2 million square miles of the EU's nation states. But with only 326 millions in population, we're significantly smaller in that regard. The European Union has a total population of 512 million. Average GDP per capita here is close to $59,000, against 42000 across the board in the EU, though there's a wide range of achieved wealth within the European nations themselves. Luxembourg, at 104000 ahead, enjoys an average income almost twice that of our average here in the United States. We're roughly on a par with the Netherlands. But an overview of the European Union would have to note at once the gulf in average wealth between the richer nations to the north and to the west, and the poorer nations to the south and to the east. Those in the north enjoy our income levels around 50,000 a head, whereas those at the furthest east and south suffer from levels less than half of this, typically around $18,000 per head. The lowest is Bulgaria, at just $8,000. The European Union is a disparate collection of nation-states, but collectively it is large. Out of interest, and because the real statistics are so rarely confronted, both the EU and the USA are their own best customers. Total trade in all goods and services amounts to $1.2 trillion a year. The United States has a slight balance of trade deficit, just $90 billion, an insignificant number, almost an error factor in such a vast arena of statistics. And finally, it may surprise you to know that both populations contain between just 1% and 2% of Muslims. We're talking today about America's most important trading partner, most important ally, and most important cultural friend. The individual and collective significance of the two economic blocks cannot be overstated. Our investments are the central driver of world growth. 
either the EU or the United States is the largest trade and investment partner for almost every other country on the globe. Together, we account for half of world GDP and one-third of all trade. In global economic terms, the future success of the European Union, our focus today, matters roughly as much as does our success here in the United States. Furthermore, as we all know, the cultural wealth of the 28 nations is massive. Its multi-thousand year history so rich and its artistic record so deep as to be a source of endless wonder, pleasure, study and recreation. Just to review the region's cultural contribution is to travel from ancient Greece through Rome to Venice and the Silk Road to the Spain of Columbus to Florence, the Renaissance, to the Reformation, Bruges, and ultimately Napoleon, London, and the British Empire. And then as the United States came into its century a hundred years ago, so the European nations, led by France and Germany, moved to establish a new way of collaborating, so that never again would they commit themselves to the searing disasters of two world wars. We're barely two minutes into this talk, and we can already draw two immense conclusions. Europe matters today as much as does the United States, at both geopolitical and cultural levels. It is manifestly worth supporting, worth getting right, and worth building as part of the fabric of a future world civilization an order seeking peace and cooperation. But at this point, the happy similarities between the United States stop being so self-evident. Europe is facing a crisis. Nationalism, racism, xenophobia, economic vulnerability, the emotional weight of history is finding a new populist voice that is drowning out cool thought and long-term planning. In a nutshell, the big lie, adapted to suit whichever audience it may be, is gaining credence, especially amongst those who are most vulnerable, those who count themselves amongst the have-nots. These people, a significant part of any economy, have been bypassed economically. There has been, it's true, a slow and steady improvement in overall economic performance across the region. But significant as this has been, it has entirely failed to relieve the depressed and desperate poor, to help the weakest nations enough, or stem the tide of popular resentment against the imp um, apparent uncaring of institutions bureaucracies, and politicians. The established political leadership has failed to appreciate the implications of the vulnerability or of the tectonic shift in global and popular communications that has taken place on their watch. This has given a new voice to the poorest and to the demagogues, and it has changed forever the dialogue now in use. It is perhaps not too much of an exaggeration to say that no amount of worthiness, of good intentions, or of scholarship amongst the established leadership has been able to offset this almost total lack of grasp that the political imperatives have moved towards rewarding the masses to a fairer distribution of wealth, a new socialism on the one hand, or on the other hand to a no less polarised, despotic, centralised rule by a power elite. This lack of touch is not new. It was encapsulated by Harold Macmillan, British Prime Minister in the late 1950s, whose election slogan 
to a recession-torn Britain was the entirely hypocritical, you've never had it so good. And it won the election. The United States today may be confronted by a new socialism. Its middle classes are also increasingly part of a hidden but no less desperate poor. The top 1% of earners here now controls a larger percentage of total national wealth than at any time since the crash of 1929. We, too, are suffering from an emasculation of traditional dialogue and from our own versions of the big lie. It may well be that the European experience over the next few years will be a significant prelude to something similar here. But we have one special strength. The United States remains a robust federation, and the petrodollar is still the world's currency. Furthermore, our country is hardly beset by significant external threats however much the administration tries to talk up the challenge from Mexico, Canada, or indeed China. Above all, this is a nation that has never experienced invasion, a hostile war, or racist threats on its own soil. But the history of Europe is very different, and it makes for an emotional tinderbox. Patriotism there is a dangerous and potent poison. Samuel Johnson called it the last refuge of the scoundrel. Bernard Shaw said, We'll never have a quiet world, world till you knock patriotism out of the human race. Let me just pause there with you for a moment. European leadership through the Un European Union has recognised and embraced globalism and the complex world of international political and economic interdependence, just as have the world's corporations. But individual electorates have not done this so wholeheartedly. In particular, those with the weakest education and the weakest earning power have resisted this shift in thinking. They have remained insular, Luddite, and welcoming to those who play back their anger. New Age populist politicians have emerged prepared to pander to this electorate, to inspire and engage its fears, however unfounded they may be, of technology, of terrorism, of immigration, especially from Africa or Asia, of international interference hacking, technological competition, and for that matter fears of confronting other global issues such as climate change or the global delivery of health care and education. We are at a tipping point. We're at a point of rising tension between an emerging understanding that the world really has gone global in the last five years and a knee-jerk kickback that seeks to avoid facing the real challenges, and above all, how to adapt our systems and structures to meet those global challenges. Instead, the populist wants to look back to focus on little nation issues, in most cases fallaciously presented, the big lie adapted to suit whichever audience he or she may be addressing. And Europe is in this crisis of transition one that will continue until its leadership addresses that tension. To understand this complex and surprising state of affairs that has seemed to emerge suddenly over the last three to five years, we need to go back in time and review the important dates that led up to the formation of the European Union itself. Almost all are to do with war with large-scale death, destruction of cities and ways of life, and to a defensive obsession with little nationhood 
exclusive identity and revenge. A triple whammy of destructive and emotional reactions, tailor-made for populist, almost feral demagogues. And in Europe today, these forces are trending to run amok. They may well trample the best intentions of the leaders of the past and destroy the Europe we want to cherish for the future. So come with me now to make a rapid historic tour d'horizon. Let's remind ourselves of the history that has moulded the challenges of today. We could say that modern Europe, certainly its subliminal memory, began on October the 21st, 1805, when 27 British ships of the line led by Admiral Lord Nelson aboard HMS Victory defeated 33 French and Spanish vessels off the southwest coast of Spain at Trafalgar. Not for a century would Britain again be challenged at sea. The British Empire followed with its engine of wealth far from the continental mainland of Europe. The Channel <coughs> would serve throughout as an impenetrable defence. In geopolitical terms, it allowed Britain always to remain hesitant about its true allegiance to the European cause, to play the options, to sit on the fence. Churchill, proud of Britain's special relationship with America, favoured what he called patronizingly the New World. And he focused his real passion on our empire. Though an enthusiast, he always spoke of Europe as their rather than our challenge. For Mrs. Thatcher, there was never a serious question of an alternative to British sovereignty or to Britain's management of its own currency, its taxes and its interest rates. Frankly, she saw much of the debate as entirely idealistic flim-flam. She said to me one day with some irritation, can we stop these constant references to European unity? It'll never come about. Britain would suffer alongside its neighbours during two world wars, but it was never invaded. Psychologically, its eyes were always set on its empire elsewhere and on its relationship with the United States. The nations on the continental mainland were to suffer an altogether different experience. And this would lead them to try to create a mutually supportive community of nations of their own. Ironically, however, those same experiences would threaten the failure of such a collaborative enterprise. The Napoleonic Wars of the turn of the 19th century set the pattern. We hear today of the period as one of French glory, romance, genius. But reality was very different. Whilst British trade doubled between 1796 and 1816, France ran out of funds and manpower as it endured first its revolution and then under Napoleon a series of massive land battles that broke and then destroyed its manhood. 12,000 died at Friedland, 23,000 at Bailleu, 44,000 at Aspen, 30,000 more at Wagram, and then 300,000 in the Spanish expedition, 450,000 in the Russian campaign, 200,000 at Leipzig, 1 million men. 30% of France's primehood, prime manhood, killed. Few historians remark how by Waterloo in 1815, Napoleon, like Hitler in 1945, had all but run out of experienced soldiery. Napoleon, too, was using children as conscripts. Napoleon's legacy to Europe was one of death, destruction and despotism inspiring a fury and a hatred articulated in two paintings by Goya, both the same subject, the pilgrimage to San Isidro. 
The first was completed in 1790, long before the Peninsula Wars, and it depicts the event as a conventional holiday. It's a light-hearted, if brilliant, conversation piece. But the second version, painted 30 years later in 1820, was after the ravages of Napoleon's armies in Spain. It is one of the epic series that Goya raged on the interior walls of his home. It is a horror story of madness, pain and fear. And at the heart of the Bedlam throng, Napoleon as a leering devil. Most of modern-day nations did not exist in the 19th century. Germany was a collection of states and principalities within the far larger empire of Austria-Hungary, which, together with the Ottoman and Russian empires, had kept a lid to a greater or lesser extent on internal revolutions, civil wars and terrorism, and it had done that for several hundred years. That was all to change with the efforts of Bismarck in the 1870s as the Prussian Chancellor created the new nation of Germany out of a unified Prussia, Baden-Württemberg, Bavaria and Hesse-Darmstadt. Bismarck recognised the yawning differences between the cultural, geographies and histories of these states, differences that remain to this day and lie behind much of the current leadership problems in that country. He was convinced that a new patriotic war would be the best ways of covering up these differences. Who better than with the external, eternal enemy, France, still hankering after one more Napoleonic hurrah? So the gauntlet was thrown. France's generals, brazenly confident of victory, reassured Emperor Napoleon III of France's supremacy, and off they all went to war on August the 19th, 1870. It was over in five months. Paris surrendered, starved and defeated. But though short-lived, the toll again was heavy. Germany suffered 117,000 dead and wounded, and France 760,000. Humiliated, the French ego was in tatters, and the ripples of its humiliation would last to today. France was forced to hand over Alsace and Lorraine in reparations, land that in its turn it would seize back at the end of World War I in 1918, and which would then form part at least of Hitler's justification for warmongering in the 1930s as he sought what he claimed to be Germany's rightful lands returned. At the start of the 20th century, Britain was happily ruling the waves, and London was the financial capital of the world. Paris, despite the 1870s, was the cultural centre, and in Berlin, Munich, and its other great cities, Germany was building its new economy. But elsewhere, a different, insidious, and dangerous economic trend was emerging. West and north of Europe were prospering. But the further east and south you travelled, the more subsistent, rural, and uncompetitive were the economies. The old empires of Austria-Hungary, Ottoman, and Russia were long exhausted. They had failed to take advantage of the Industrial Revolution. They had failed to adapt. They were living on borrowed time, on myths of the past that would be shattered by two world wars. Twenty million died in the fighting between 1914 and 1918, and then a further twenty million in the Spanish flu epidemic that followed. What is often ignored is that the killings did not stop with the armistice of 1918. Throughout Europe, and especially the further east and south you went, the killings continued and would mould the psyche of nations today. Any understanding of Europe today must include the terrible and ongoing local wars 
social upheavals, reprisals, religious and tribal killings. They continued throughout the period what Churchill called the Unknown Wars, a period that stretched with greater or lesser pain from 1918 to the end of the 1930s. And a further 10 million died. More villages and towns were laid waste. New hatreds and resentments were created. There were no empire high commands to keep the peace. All of the emperors had been slain or deposed. Instead, all sides, victors and vanquished, were ruined. All were defeated. Everything had been given in vain. Nothing was gained by anyone. And those that survived, the exhausted veterans of countless battle days, returned, whether recognised or alone, to homes engulfed in catastrophe. The challenge to individuals was in their poverty, their loneliness, and their lack of opportunity. I read recently the French author Simonon's first Maigret novel, written in the late 20s and published in 1931. The detective is trying to locate a town. I had to look it up in an atlas, he says. It's not far from the Baltic. There are several small countries there, Estonia, Lithuania, Latvia, with Poland and Russia surrounding them. And then he goes on, it was not, in what was really no more than a contemporary account of common experience at the time. The new national borders don't match the old ethnic ones anymore. From one village to the next, you change language. You've got Jews spread out all over, a separate race. And besides that, the communists. There are border war wars going on all the time. Armies, armies of ultranationalists, people living on pine cones in the woods. The poor over there are poorer than anywhere else. They're dying of cold and hunger. For those living in the East, there was no hiding place. There were more than 27 violent exchanges of political power, civil wars and ongoing actions of terror in just the five years following the end of the World War in 1918. An arc of aggression stretched from the Baltic states through the Ukraine, Poland, the now enfeebled Austria, Hungary and Germany to Anatolia and the Caucasus. Some, like Churchill, confronted the reality. Nobel laureate W.B. Yeats wrote in a contemporary poem, Things fall apart, the centre cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. A great deal had changed in just 30 years. A political heavyweight visiting Europe in 1900 really had only five or six calls to make. After a stay in London and Paris, he would have visited the leaders of the three empires, possibly the newly formed Germany and Italy, both just three years old. He could have gone on a, done the trip in two weeks. Six big cities, six dinners, a few more functions, a bit of sightseeing, and then home. But 30 years later, and the trip was a very different matter, a new set of nations had emerged. Your politician now had 32 nations on his list, from Finland, Estonia and Latvia in the north, south to Slovenia, Albania and Macedonia, with Hungary and Romania en route, each with a newly formed and proud history. Each with its own language, or languages. Each with its own strengths and weaknesses. All new and economically and politically vulnerable. Some, like the Baltic states, so obviously a buffer zone between the West and the erupting revolution in Russia. Some, like Poland, Czechoslovakia and Hungary, with both Russia to their East and the new fascist Germany to the West. Just look at Poland's immediate geopolitical actions after its formation in 1919. It agreed a special status for its predominantly German-speaking port of Danzig. It quelled disputes with its Russian-speaking citizens in what had become Greater Poland. It squashed four uprisings against Silesian and East Prussian minorities and coped furthermore 
with six different border wars involving Czechoslovakia, Ukraine, and Soviet Russia itself. And these were no small actions. The current administration here does not appear to understand that part of the role of the European NATO members today is to act as a physical buffer to Russia. The immense support given to Germany by the Marshall Plan was given not just to help Germany rebuild, but to hold the line against the Iron Curtain. What was to become a NATO initiative was a role first articulated by Poland in the 20s. It was its largest forgotten victory, the Battle of Warsaw, over the newly formed Soviet army that convinced Lenin and Soviet Russia once and for all to stay back within their own country. All the new nations needed new structures, new institutions, new identities to help them cope with the new responsibilities of governing. They needed new patriotic stories to cement their often disparate peoples into a nation, to give them something to believe in. In the main, their populations were small. They endured subsistence agriculture and had little industry. They were struggling throughout to accommodate a new social mix. Poland, judged by its 1931 census, was 60% Polish, 10% German, 10% Lithuanian, 10% Russian, and 10% Czech. For them all, nationhood was a priority. The imperative economic survival. What of the growing gulf between the haves and the have-nots, both within each nation and externally between nations? Overall unemployment in Europe at the time has been estimated at 25%. And as with all the other statistics, things just get worse the further east and south you look. And then came the crash of the New York stock market of 1929. When in July 1933 the index at last stopped falling, shares here in the United States stood at just 15% of their 1929 value. 25% of the American workforce was out of a job. But the US depression hit Europe like a sledgehammer. In Germany, 9 million out of a total workforce of 20 millions, nearly 50% were unemployed. There were no statistics for youth unemployment. In three years, Germany's economy declined by 16%, Poland 18%, Austria by 22%. Here, right out of the gate, lay the foundation for the social upheavals about to erupt, just as the new countries were trying to get their acts together. Russian communists pretended to foster a new populist, if entirely misleading, sensitivity to the struggle. It gave a voice to the have-nots, and so remained a constant thorn in the side of the new democracies, in no way helping to resolve the pain of poverty, always pretending to offer a solution. The new governments were challenged, and the results were there to see in nation after nation. In Austria, the Dolphus dictatorship was established in 1932. There was an army coup in Bulgaria that year. Other dictatorships followed in Hungary, Latvia, Poland and Portugal. And then, in 1933, Adolf Hitler became the Chancellor of Germany and drove his country and Europe back to war on a grand swell of nationalism, racism and xenophobia. In Europe, World War II ushered in a repeat of the whole terrible process. The killings the destruction, and the suffering all over. Only this time, there was the added dimension of Stalin and the USSR. Poland, for example, invaded and occupied first by Nazi Germany, and then by Communist Russia. None of us know how we would cope with such hostile invaders, and it's no surprise that to this day, Poland is trying to deny its role in the Holocaust. And once again, historians ignore 
the immediate aftermath of 1945. Because once again, the war did not stop with Hitler's defeat. Nothing like. Especially again in the East, civil wars continued to rage as they had done 15 years earlier. There was fighting in the Ukraine and in the Baltic well into the 1950s between national forces and Soviet troops. Most countries, unsurprisingly, record fighting until the last Soviet soldier left. 1989 in Poland, and a couple of years later, 1991, in Estonia, Lithuania and Latvia. This aftermath saw one other unexpected and again largely ignored event. Many of the newly formed nations, seeking to emphasize their new identity, effectively took the earlier racial efforts by the Nazis to their logical conclusion and expelled all those who were not indigenous. Tens of millions were forcibly, often violently expelled in the hidden, but nonetheless biggest act of ethnic cleansing the world has ever seen. The culture of racial diversity that had been so rich a feature of the European empires was dealt a death blow. The first target, of course, was the Germans, murdered, tortured, expelled from all non-German countries. Forced labour camps sprang up all over Poland. Tens of thousands died from malnutrition and disease. In all, more than 12 million indigenous Germans were expelled from the new nations in the east, in particular Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary and Romania. Destitute, homeless, without an identity, they were still hundreds of thousands in refugee camps in the early 1950s. The ongoing death toll was enormous. All of these nations have cause for long and troubling memories when faced with the refugee challenges of today. Towns with German-sounding names were renamed. In schools, new patriotic songs were sung. New national histories were taught. Populist slogans emphasised Poland for the Polish, Hungary for the Hungarians, and so on. This talk is about the crisis facing Europe today and the massive part that history plays in the cumulative psyche of nations. It is highly significant that it was not only the Germans who were expelled from hitherto multiracial countries where they had in many cases lived well for generations. Remember between 1918 and 1945 all these nations had fought each other. Now was the time for revenge, for wholesale cleansing, and for bitter and small reckonings. The Slovaks expelled 600,000 Hungarians, as did Romania. Albanians were driven out of Greece, Italians from Yugoslavia, Turks from Bulgaria. Eastern Europe, by 1950, was a vast churn of refugees, lost peoples amid increasingly xenophobic and ethnically concentrated states. The emotional archive, or memory, was set for the big lie of today. A knee-jerk fear of foreigners, of immigrants, of people who might not be like us. Even today, a generation later, we still exaggerate the immigration statistics in an emotionally driven negativism entirely unjustified by reality. After two years of populist jingoism here in the United States, a recent Harvard study has shown the popular perception is that nearly 40% of our population are immigrants. The actual figure is 12%. Europe from 1800 suffered extreme turmoil. Only Britain and France lasted the course as independent and unchanged nations. Italy and Germany were not even established at the start of the period. Apart from Britain, all nations suffered invasions. Most were heroic, that they could even hold on to their identity at all. And some did not achieve freedom 
until the 1990s. Never under underestimate the pull of history. Let me summarise the experience of just one little country, of Latvia. Today it is a sovereign state in the Baltic region of Northern Europe. After centuries of Swedish, Polish and then Russian rule, it was established in 1918 as it broke away from Russia in the aftermath of World War I. A coup in the 30s saw a brief period of dictatorships before being forcibly incorporated into the new Soviet Union, then invaded by Nazi Germany in 1941, and then reoccupied by the Soviets in 1944. It won its independence back finally in 1990, 46 years later. Today, Latvia, with a population of just 2 million, is a rapidly developing country, and its lovely capital, Riga, was the European centre of culture in 2014. But its memories will never be forgotten. Every five years in July, and stretching back through the period since the 19th century, nearly 150 years, the persecuted Latvians have reminded themselves of their original identity through seven days of music and song. It's called the Singing Revolution. It's a reawakening of the national consciousness. A deeply emotional, frankly heart-rending event that this year drew 500,000 Latvians to take part. Most of the adult population of the nation. Nations care about their histories, whether they are large or small. Over the last 20 years or so, Latvia, a buffer state if ever there was one, has benefited from the protection of NATO as it has encountered the nagging disruptions from Russia. At the same time, it has benefited from the trade assurance of its membership of the European Union. Nevertheless, though its GDP per head is growing at a healthy 4%, it's still only $15,000. But it's done well in employment terms. 40% youth unemployment under Russian rule has steadily come down to 11% in the middle of 2018. Russian provocations remain an everyday way of life. Latvia still needs all the support the Western alliances can give. So the European Union had a lengthy incubation. As far back as 1918, the Allies at Versailles, led by American President Wilson, were already concerned to stop forever the pattern of war, reparations, vengeance and destruction. Woodrow Wilson, more than a century ahead of his time, proposed a League of Nations. However, it was not to be. Clemenceau and the French were still thirsting for revenge. Lloyd George and the British, sitting on the fence, were just tired and depressed. Lloyd George left Paris as soon as he could, saying, we'll have to do the whole thing again in 25 years' time. Too weak, too late, but no less prophetic for all that. Without their resolve, Wilson, alas, could not command the support from an isolationist America safely enjoying life 3,000 miles away. It was not until 1951 that the concept of a European trade area was established in the form of a coal and steel community with just six members, Belgium, France, Germany, Italy, Luxembourg and the Netherlands. The European Union today has grown to be a community of 28 nations. It has survived the Cold War. It has outlasted the dictatorships of Portugal's Salazar and Spain's Franco. It has helped to bring about the collapse of the Soviet Union, and it has extended its reach, welcome and protection to a whole eastern border of former Soviet vassal states from Estonia through Latvia to Bulgaria. It is a monumental achievement a powerhouse of trade and technology, and a massive force for good in the world. It is understood that the heart of economic growth is the free flow of goods and the no less free flow of ideas, of state-of-the-art technology to all its members, and it has worked. 
half of the members were enjoying real GDP growth rates over 3% in 2017. It has championed important areas of innovation in environmental protection, in research and development, in healthcare, education and in energy. Any product manufactured in one country can be sold to any other member without tariffs or duties. Taxes have been standardised. Practitioners of professionals can operate freely in all member countries, something we haven't yet achieved in the United States. The EU has embraced globalisation and it has a common currency, the euro. The everyday value of the euro compared to the United States dollar, the unofficial world currency, is the most widely watched currency relationship. But there we start to see some of the challenges being faced by the Union today. In fact, only 19 members have so far converted to the euro. Great Britain in particular, still conflicted, has remained protective of sterling and of London as the de facto financial capital of Europe. The major British parties and peoples have throughout remained politically hesitant to commit fully to the European ideal. Britain has all along been a country divided socially and geographically. Roughly 50% of the nation is in favour of Europe. They're in the main the youngest, the best educated, they live in London and the South, and increasingly they've enjoyed the new international jobs market, the travel, and the access to different, often brilliant cultures, histories, and environments that are now easily available to them but the other 50% have remained sensitive to their own local cultures, to nationhood, their exclusive and winning history. They've developed pride in their sovereignty, and they've come to resent any threat to their hard-won independence of action. And they've come to resent immigrants. At its worst, those pro-Europe a caricatured as faddish and supercilious winos, and the little in Englanders as fascist soccer hooligans. On June the 23rd, 2016, however, this stopped being a joke, as the Prime Minister, the self-serving and myopic David Cameron, made an historic miscalculation and allowed the Brexit referendum, which he then bungled and lost. I want to spend a moment on the how and the why the British acted in this drama before looking into the unfolding issues elsewhere in Europe. You see, Britain is a successful economy. It's a lead player. If it cannot manage its affairs, then why should we expect other nations far more at risk to do any better? In Britain, the politicians were at best worthy. At worst, ill-briefed, ill-coordinated, dishonest, and lacking in any ability to communicate with the general voter. It's hard to see any robust leadership. Immigration and the cost of membership became parts of the new lie. That Harvard study showed the British also perceiving immigrants at, as nearly 40% of its population where the real figure was also around just 12%. Typically, immigrant numbers in the UK, mostly from the Commonwealth, had run at around 60,000 a year. That's the average every year from 1991 to 2003. But as more countries joined the EU, especially those from the East, with weaker economies, so the numbers climbed of those seeking work in the more prosperous Britain. And in 2013, there were 200,000 immigrants, nearly 300,000 in 2014. In practice, for a population of 70 million, 300,000 is hardly a statistically relevant number. And Britain's leaders should have pointed to their rich and proud history as a multiracial community, to the Commonwealth and to Europe and to the well-reported value added these immigrants had created. 
The second lie was the so-called colossal cost of Britain's membership. UKIP quoted 25 billion a year, or as they repeatedly said on the stump, 500 millions a week. This was in fact the initial demand made by the Europeans during the original negotiations, but by the time Mrs Thatcher had finished, the actual figure was less than a third of this, and that's before allowing for the huge gains made by the emerging, competitive UK economy. Overall, Britain benefited hugely. The actual short-term costs were a pinprick of expenditure for an economy of nearly three trillion. The ill-prepared British politicians dithered and capitulated. They didn't have the stomach for a real fight, and furthermore, they were ill-focused. They had missed the real ball. Efficiency and population growth in the UK was falling. Efficiency is now around 25% below that of the United States or Germany. We needed population growth. Economics matter. So Cameron resigned and took to the highly paid international speakers circuit. He left behind a Westminster split every which way, including the emerging fascist party of UKIP and the wholly unprepared f- and wholly unprepared for the consequences of its ill-considered folly in allowing referendum to happen in the first place. If ever a charismatic leader was needed, it was now. But instead of a new Churchill or Thatcher, Britain is led, if that's the right word, by the entirely uncharismatic Theresa May. It's in serious trouble and looks determined to stay there. I said Westminster had been ill-prepared. Britain is only now starting to appreciate that it really must leave by March next year. 2019. It has very little time, and its politicians are in disarray. Airbus, the European aerospace giant, has recently warned it needs a great deal more clarity or it will leave the country. Growth in business investment has fallen by 50% since 2015. Just look at the prospect facing the economic powerhouse of London. As of March 2019, no banker, no insurance company, lawyer or other professional will automatically be able to operate from London inside the European Union as they do today. New terms and laws have to be negotiated in the next eight months. And the professionals in question requalified, tested and accepted according to whatever the new regulations stipulate. Politicians in Britain have become more populist as they perceive the futility of their situation. Let me define the use of that word. Populist politicians are a dangerous breed of cat. Brought up and familiar with the soundbite, Twitter, how to court, use, even abuse, the huge, often naively directed power of the media, they use the language of the street to reach the street and to reach their mass audience. Populist is essentially a pejorative label, but it's no more effective for that. Populist massage the truth to grab attention. At their most effective, they command attention in much the way as did Lenin and Hitler as they sought to rally their nations. Their theme is the repeated big lie. They rely on repetition to carry the unthinking public vote. Today the debate is increasingly negative, as much about immigration as it is here in the United States. Both nations have, as I've already said, been built on the acceptance and richness of a multiracial population. Britain enjoyed this as part of its legacy of empire, America as part of its great history, and like Britain, it too needs immigrants now if it is not to lose economic edge, as its own population ages and dwindles. 
Brexit is doubly important in this European story because Britain remains a lead nation, as I've mentioned. It sets an example. It has broken the mould and it cannot be ignored. And just in case we think that we here 3,000 miles away can take a flippant attitude to this mess, remember this matters here too. US companies have been Britain's largest investors. We have invested more than half a trillion dollars and we employ more than one million people there. How these negotiations go matters. And we should be no less interested from the point of view of our relations with Europe itself, our largest trading partner. These negotiations, resolving this mess, matters to us in the United States. So Britain is leaving Europe and many economically and politically vulnerable new members behind it. The first members all belong to the affluent North, affluent North and West. However, political thinking evolved, and by the early 1980s, the Commission saw its role to include all European countries. A geopolitical drive overcame economic reality. Protagonists saw enlargement as valuable in its own right. Greece joined in 1981, Spain and Portugal in 1986, and then in 2004, 12 nations, mostly freed from the yoke of Soviet Russia, Bulgaria, the Czech Republic, Estonia, Hungary, Latvia, Poland, Romania, Slovakia and Slovenia, together with Cyprus and Malta. These nations brought with them the tragic histories I've outlined at some length. Genocides that meant two today still remain monoracial. Poland and Romania, like Japan, have almost no foreign-born citizens. Greece and Hungary and the Czech Republic, just 5%. Remember, we in the United States and those in the UK have nearly three times that percentage. The total foreign-born population here in the United States is 20%. Most of the new additions as members were economically at risk. As we've seen, despite good things, GDP per capita today ranges between just 8,000 in Bulgaria to a mean of 20,000, less than half that of the richer members or of the United States. Total unemployment in Greece is, about, is above 20%. Spain stands at 16%. It's around 10% throughout the new states. Youth unemployment around 10% here in the United States, averages 20% in the EU, nearly 32% in Italy, over 40% in Spain and Greece. And the internal economic differences between the north and the south of Italy, for example, or between Madrid and Barcelona in Spain, or as in the now emerging between Prussia and Bavaria in Germany, reflects pockets of extreme unemployment and of long-standing cultural differences that have never been resolved. We are talking about a lost generation. We're talking about internal resentments, a recipe for civil unrest, a social petri dish for extremists and for emotional populism. Britain and Brexit have opened the Pandora's box. The promise of European membership was not just freedom from Russia. It was also a promise of gainful employment, a fast track to joining the haves, an affluent life. The EU leaders, their eyes on enlargement, lent money to countries with little opportunity for growth, let alone for levels of profitability that would allow them to pay back the debts they embraced to try to kick-start their economies and give their peoples a shot at affluence. So despite the achievements, it's not difficult to paint a picture of the EU experiment now as one of economic failure, unable to resolve the debt burden of Greece at 180% of their GDP, or of Italy at 130%, or of the other eight countries with debt levels over 80%, a list, by the way, that includes both France and the UK. 
and we have to come back to immigration. The total foreign-born population in Europe in 2014 was 33 million, just 7% of the total population. But already fences had been constructed between Turkey and Greece to withstand the migrants escaping the wars in the Middle East and the desertification caused by the other global phenomenon, climate change, global warming across North Africa. The Italian Prime Minister, Berlusconi, created a shameless private deal with Libya to return migrants. These measures violated the liberal and laudable European Convention on Human Rights, as do the most recent efforts that we read about in the newspapers every day, by Hungary, Poland, Austria and Italy, to resist the migrants still coming from Syria, Somalia and the Sudan. One million in the year 2015. But bureaucrats making rules is one thing. Nations dealing with the causes of the crisis is quite another. And Europe has done little. Turkey, the bridge between Europe and North Africa, has acted very differently. President Ergen, Erdogan, claimed by the White House as a special friend, has cemented his grip on power and overseen a crackdown. The leader of the opposition is in jail. Lawyers, judges, civil servants and journalists are threatened under a cobbled state of emergency declared two years ago. This has already meant the detention of an estimated 140,000 people, the closure of 189 media outlets and the arrest of more than 300 journalists. Erdogan's eyes have moved increasingly towards President Putin and his neighbour Russia. His aim to centralise power, to forge a strong state, to combat immigration terrorism and from his recent decisions to constrain learning, education, free thought and change. Turkey is evolving into a religious Islamic state. Opinion is polarised as Erdogan is threatening a dictatorship. There are three million Syrian refugees in Turkey and they must now be returned home. Turkey has declared war on the Kurds. The lira has dropped 20% and national debt is spiring out of control. The process for Turkey to become a member of the European Union has stopped. It's not hard to sympathise with the resentment of unemployed young people when seeing such numbers of refugees lounging in their medieval squares. The European leaders miscalculated when, led by Angela Merkel, they thought they could treat this as proof of their special liberalism. In Germany, the ponderous and un uncharismatic Merkel is facing serious challenge from her vocal Bavarian coalition partner, Horst Seehofer, and the topic is immigration. The situation has not been helped by President Trump twittering falsely about the collapse of law and order there and venting his dislike of Merkel. Indeed, it's hard to think of a more incompetent attitude to foreign policy than is being exhibited by this great country at the moment. Even the German economy is showing signs of slipping. The IFO Institute has just cut its growth expectations for 2018 from 2.6% to 1.9% in the face of US trade policy changes and foreign policy hysteria. Merkel's coalition is near to collapse. In France, Macron is always confronted by the threat of Marie Le Pen and her fascist followers. Italy has become a decisive, divisive force as the new Prime Minister Giuseppe Conti and the Interior Minister Sal Matteo Salvini represent the new anti-immigrant populist government, determined their government shall never again be overrun as it was two years ago. Salvini has commandeered the political conversation, including his attack on the Roma population. This is all, of course, part of a big lie. 
Salvini knows his beautiful country is economically divided between the rich north and the poorer south. 8% and rising of all Italians live in absolute poverty. But hunting gypsies provides a cheap scapegoat. The total immigrant numbers have dwindled to just 40,000 so far this year, but that hasn't stopped the vitriol from Salvini or from Sebastian Kurz of Austria. It will come as no surprise to hear Marie Le Pen supporting the far-right stand send them back, she says. And once again, none of this has been helped by the United States' determination to intervene and disrupt. In June, the newly appointed United States ambassador to Germany said he wanted to empower right-wing nationalist movements across Europe. Different levels of affluence, the rising threat of debt, unemployment amongst the young, are now a very real long-term threat of Turkey's collapse and of more African immigrants. Add up to a potent challenge to a Europe already charged with bureaucratic obfuscation and inactivity. The new member nations struggling to find their feet add a new dimension to the problems. In monoracial Hungary, Viktor Orban has built his demagogy on his attacks on immigration and liberal thinkers. Orban oligarchs have taken over parts of the media in neighbouring Slovenia and Macedonia to help the popular Slovenian Jansa to power. In Poland, Jaroslav Kaczynski, the dominant political figure, emotionally deranged by the death of his twin brother, has allied himself with Oban and Hungary, and is busy disbanding the judiciary as a prelude to pushing his own brand of despotism. An East European populist cabal is forming. Wherever you look, Europe today is facing very difficult challenges. Perhaps the greatest is the emergence of this wholly new populist tone, one the traditional bureaucrats and old-style politicians simply do not understand, and will find it, I believe, impossible to resist. In this context, Europe needs once more, if ever it could find it, the steadying hand of a strategically sophisticated and diplomatically commanding friend in the United States. Alas, this is not there. It is as though all the hounds of hell have been slipped free on the moment, and no one is there to help. Europe is facing a crisis. Music